Hi, I'm Greg Mickling. New Jersey credit unions believe that all citizens need to understand the important financial matters that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Felician College, Health Republic, Insurance of New Jersey. QualCare, Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Johnson & Johnson, NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. And by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce for the first time here on 101, Mr. George Cardenas, Vice President, Asset Management, Centralized Services, PSENG. George, so you're here to talk about uh, a PSENG plan, very important plan called Energy Strong. We've talked to Ralph LaRosa, who uh, helps lead your, your uh, company. This plan, Energy Strong, talked about post-Hurricane Sandy to deal with what? Uh, to deal with the impacts of severe weather events both high wind events as well as tidal events like we had with Sandy, as well as uh, the types of events like Irene, which uh, caused New Jersey to, to have floods in many of the uh, inner areas associated with rivers overflowing. So let's break it down. You've got three primary areas I see here. Uh, uh, we needed to deal with switching stations. What does that mean? 29 repairing and upgrading switching stations. What does that mean? It means that uh, for the first time in 50, 70 years, stations that had never seen water uh, as a result of the tidal surge associated with Sandy. Is that a switching station we're looking at right there? Uh, that is a switching station. Yeah, go ahead. That is a sea warrant switching station. And the water levels in that station literally were about five feet. Wow. Above the ground. And, and many of these stations, the majority of these stations, had never seen flooding before. So what we're going to do with those stations is literally build them again next to them, probably on the same property, at an elevated uh, level, a level which will be about a foot higher than what uh, FEMA has uh, indicated would government. be. The federal government has so indicated. So if we have a storm, really bad storm again, what does that mean? What happens there? It means that uh, that station will stay in service. So the we don't only, lose power. You, well, the station will not, and many customers will not, unless there is damage to the wires that are out on the street that come out of the station and feed your home. Okay, those, those would still be damaged, but you would have power in the station and out. The other thing I talked to Ralph LaRosa about that I want you to talk about as well, we talked mm -hmm. to Ralph LaRosa on Capital Report. He's also been on our sister program, NJTV News, talking about this. Creating redundancy, that's what part of yes. the Energy Strong plan is. I'm thinking redundancy, that's not a good thing, but it is a good thing. It is a good thing in terms of the electrical system because if you have only one source of electricity and that source is severed from its source, the wires, then you lose power. If you can feed that in a loop from another direction, then those customers can be restored automatically without having to do anything. That's redundancy? That's redundancy. Uh, we want, we have some of those systems in place where we have two feeds, we want to bring in a third feed. Uh, that way, even if you lose two feeds, you would still maintain service to the majority so you're of backing your it customers. Up. It's a backup. How about this one? Smart grid technology. <laughs> okay. So a lot of people talk about smart grid. They think that it's all about a meter. It's not about a meter. For us, what it means is we're going to put these protective devices on our circuits that will tell us where the damage occurred so that we can dispatch people to that location. These devices that will protect the circuits will talk to each other as well. And in so doing, know where to uh, open and close such that you can restore the majority of the customers when an event takes place. Now, you said to me right before we got on the air that, that Energy Strong is a start. It is a start. 
uh, there's much more to be done. Uh, we have approval to invest $1.2 billion. That'll be done over the next three years. We see this as, a, as a more of a 10-year program. Uh, once we get done with that, we will definitely be back and address other areas that uh, were what not else addressed. Has to be done? Uh, additional replacement of gas mains. We're going to do about 250 miles of gas mains. It's much more to be done there. Uh, much more smart grid. Uh, smart grid is, is very good from uh, a resiliency perspective, the ability to get customers back quickly. Mm -hmm. And to also, when you do have an event, uh, be able to dispatch large numbers of people to make repairs without manually having to do things to protect the, uh, the people who are working on, on doing the repairs. What are we looking at right there, by the way, that picture? That's a truck uh, with all our people on it. I'm trying Doing to... good things, that's all right. <laughs> it's, it's, and by uh, the way, before I let you out of here, creating a lot of jobs with this plan. Absolutely. Uh, we will create about 2,400 jobs wow. for New Jersey. With the Energy Strong Plan? With the Energy Strong Program for the duration of that wow. program for those, for those three years. 400 jobs. Uh, George, this is important stuff. Make sure that you and your colleagues at PSCNG keep updating us on this plan and also on our uh, other program, Capital Report, and on NJTV News, okay? Thank you very much. Stay it's right a there. Good stuff. Thank you. This is one-on-one. -on -one. We're keeping you updated on uh, keeping the power going. Right after this, we'll be right back. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by our good friend Jeff Petrowski, President and CEO of Airbrook Limousine. Good to see you, Jeff. It's nice to be here, Steve. Thank you. You and I have, uh, by the way, Airbook uh, takes care of us and a lot of our guests. And you and I having a conversation recently about uh, your industry, <clears throat> excuse my voice, and how much things have been changing. And one of the things you told me about was this global service. Now, we'll talk about how challenging it is, the transportation industry in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area in a minute. But talk about the global service. What's that all about? Well, we're rolling out a, a network of providers. Um, they're all individual providers that we are um, teaming up with around the globe and we're um, so setting up a work? website. So we set up a website and the website automatically distributes these reservations to these providers. And all these providers are, are vetted. We, we know the companies. Um, they're all the top companies in their markets. So I'm going to so go to Paris. We know that, I'm yes. going to go to Paris. We had this conversation over right. lunch one day. You said, Steve, you were in Paris. You didn't know who you were dealing with, right? Right. Hey, but I'm going to Paris, I go through Airbrook, what happens? Uh, you go through Airbrook and you place the reservation just like you place a reservation to go from here to Manhattan. And I, I'll pick you up in, in Paris and I'll take you where you need to go. And Because you have the relationship I, with the folks in Paris? Right, yeah. We, we actually do Paris quite a bit now. And um, you know, we have a good relationship with the, the company we use out there. Why is that so important for people who are traveling abroad, they get there, they don't really know who they're dealing with. Well, when you're, when you're traveling ab abroad, you don't know necessarily what uh, the price should be, okay? And, and we're going to be giving you market prices. And, um, you know, we've done things before where we needed to bring some people from a ship to a hotel in, um, in Italy, and they were going to pay um, something like $60 a head to go <laughs> on this five minute ride. You could get and the shaft. We got them uh, a van to take them from the ship to the hotel for, you know, Whatever less than $100 or something for the whole group. You know, and that's the difference. That's you the could difference get taken you, advantage of. Exactly. exactly. You really could. And the other thing that's so interesting about that, it, it, to bring it back, back home, um, is you were also, when we were talking about this, you could talk about, you talked about, being taken advantage of, someone says, well, um, I want to use an online, online car service. Yes. You don't know the company, you go online, you could be taken advantage of, but also it's worse, go ahead. Well, there's, um, right now, there's online companies out there that, that they're actually, all they are is a referral service. Um, and 
they they even in their disclaimer when you go to to log on to their site and everything you know and you register as a user under their business they say that they have they take no responsibility for the person you're getting in the car with and um, the one driver? of these services the driver like anything. we don't we have whatever happens happens right i went on i went on one of the sites last night and um in preparation for this show and uh in order to become a driver for them, you need to have your own car, your own um, driver's license, and your own insurance. And in the state of New Jersey, you can get away with $10,000 in insurance. Whereas if you go with a reputable company, you're gonna have millions of dollars of, of insurance behind you, protecting you um, in the event that, that so something happens. So who could happens. that guy or that woman be behind the they wheel? They could be anybody. All they need is a driver's license. That's it? That's it. So something happens. Who's responsible? Well, that's that remains to be seen. There's there's been a, several incidents right. um, that people you know you can read about it in the news, and um, it remains to be seen who's going to be held responsible. You know, um, ultimately, uh, these referral services are saying that it's the the driver is responsible. That it's that all they're doing is referring the work. It's almost like file sharing was back in the 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 nineties. You know where. Sure. Um, companies were trading, uh, you know, digital files and stuff and saying... And for our oh, audience, we just want to make sure you're not getting in a car with somebody you don't know and someone says, I'm not responsible. The other thing we're, that I find fascinating is, you know, in the New York, New Jersey market, right? Yes. One of the things that's fascinating is finding park and dealing with traffic. Yes. You were saying more and more people live in New Jersey going into Manhattan for shows, whatever it is, dinner. Yes. Are using car service because? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the cost is just getting... Um, outrageous and um, I recently took a trip in to New York City with my family and I like to drive when when we're going out with the children and stuff and we went to the Javits Center to the car show and that's way when, over on the west side yeah all the way over on the west side and it took us probably at least a half an hour to find parking and then it took us a half hour just to get into the parking lot and then we were two blocks away and it started to rain so now we got to walk two blocks to the Javits Center. And the parking, the cost of the parking, I have an SUV, so it was $57 to park my SUV. Uh, it's $13 to come over the bridge just to get into to New York City. And after, um, after the car show, we wanted to go out to eat, but we waited till we got back to New Jersey because we didn't want to go through and pay for parking once again and everything else. Do the so. math. Yeah, exactly, exactly, it does. And the convenience and everything else, I mean, um, you know, to come out of a, a show or something and have your driver be right there in front, you don't have to go. If you've ever waited for your car in the theater district after the, the show's <laughs> let out, um, you know, you could wait an hour for your car, yeah. you know. And um, it's so much nicer than your car business. Be sitting right there. And by the way, we should make it clear that uh, um, Jeff's dad, Don, Petrowski uh, started the business 40 years ago, and uh, and we miss your dad, and, and uh, he yeah, we sure was do. a great friend to public broadcasting, and was a giant in this industry, and you guys are one of the top 10, you know, right in the area? Oh, sure. In the country. Sure, sure. And, uh, we listen. hope to be soon number one in the world. Yeah, so. well, listen, I want to thank you for coming on and talking to us about not only what's going on in this region in terms of transportation and car service, but also around the uh, globe as well. Very Appreciate good. it, Jeff. Good job. Thank you, Steve. Stay right there. Okay. One on one will continue right after this. To see more one on one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, Steve Adubato. We're here at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. This is a, um, a very important conference. It's the conference on big data and the implications for healthcare in the state of New Jersey. We're honored to have uh, the Commissioner of Health and Senior Services, Mary O'Dowd, with us. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing great. So we're here at Princeton. We are. This is great. It is. You just spoke to this conference and you shared with them an important message. What was it? Well, one of the things that I'm here to talk about is what the Department of Health 
um, on behalf of the state of New Jersey has done to invest in health information technology. And there are two main areas. One is around clinical data, and that's really helping our hospitals, physician offices, and all the traditional healthcare providers invest and benefit from health information technology and share it amongst themselves. We've helped them build a system of regional health information organizations where they can share data amongst themselves for their community. And we're also building a health information network, which is the highway that allows these organizations to share data statewide amongst each other. Commissioner, break that down for examples. So people say, can say, that sounds fascinating, right. but what does it mean to me? So what it means to you is, if you are a patient who shows up in an emergency department in one area of the state, but yet you have providers in other areas say, that treat you regularly, this would allow that emergency room to reach out to their um, health information organization to say, I have Steve in my ER right now. Can you find out if he's been to the hospital anywhere else recently or at the physician office? You can find that out. They can reach out and share amongst the network that we've built for them to find that out. Now, we're in the beginning stages, so we've just New Jersey is. New Jersey. Um, many of the, the regional health information organizations can already do this regularly, but what we're building, where we are in the beginning stages, is actually allowing Camden to communicate with Newark, um, letting Trenton communicate with um, Summit. Mm. so that they're talking to each other even though they're not in the same local region. So, Commissioner, let me ask you this. So, we talked to your colleague in New York, New York State. Yes, Narav. Mm -hmm. He was talking about what they're doing, and they seem, mm -hmm. frankly, further ahead than we are. Is that a fair assessment? I don't know. I, I like that yeah, answer. I don't know. But he made it sound like they're doing certain things. Which what, kind of things? Well, he talked about the technology that mm -hmm. they're using, and he talked about the challenges they face as well. What would you say a challenge we face in New Jersey is that you, is unique to our culture, if you will, when it comes to information technology and healthcare? I would say that one of the challenges that we've experienced is that we have a lot of competition amongst our healthcare providers. Now, I don't know is that's that true? unique. <laughs> I don't know that that is unique. I mean, I, I, I've noticed that there's some competition yes. amongst New York providers as well. Yes. Um, but I think that one of the really important hurdles that the providers have to get over is that they have to collaborate together. And this gets to another point of mine, which is the public health side of sharing data. Um, I presented today some of the reports that we've put out that show um, the opportunity to improve our community's health, um, preventable hospitalizations. How many times? Preventable? Time Hospitalization. Right. For example. So, for example, someone who, if they manage their diabetes a little bit better, they wouldn't have to go to the emergency room and potentially into the hospital as an inpatient. Um, so, resetting the bar, allowing um, an understanding how to invest in preventive primary care to avoid more serious complications and hospitalizations for patients. We have three areas of our state that are working and have been nationally recognized for the work they're doing to collaborate, um, Jeff Brenner in Camden, yeah. the Trenton Health Team in Trenton, doing great and, work. and our Newark team as well, all working together to try to build a system of sharing data to better manage care. Um, often we are talking about just the healthcare setting, so the doctor's office, the hospital, but on the public health side, we put out a report and share data the on- The department did? Correct. Allowing individuals to see on a regional level what are the diseases that patients could be treated for better in the community, but are not necessarily getting the support they need and are ending up in the hospital? Mm. And that's an opportunity for us to really share data in an effective way from a public health perspective and a health care perspective to really raise the bar and improve the health for our community. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Sharon Lewin, who is Director of Gynecologic Oncology at Holy Name Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you. Let's talk about a whole range of... Um, uh, issues that you deal with in terms of uh, oncology, but um, it, we t right before we get in the air, I asked you about ovarian cancer, then breast cancer. Put it in perspective, ovarian cancer, one out of every 71 women? 
Well, thankfully, only about 22,000 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the United States this year. So it's not a very common cancer, the fifth most common cancer in women. Fifth? Correct. The most common is? Well, we look at lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, are much more common cancers in women than ovarian right. cancer. So re your specialty is reproductive cancers? I'm a gynecologic oncologist. Okay. Yes. But what does it mean? Break that down in non-clinical terms. So we take care of women who have cancer that arises from the female reproductive tract, as you mentioned. So it's either ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, or cancers of the cervix, vagina, vulva, uh, one of the female genital organs. Do you find that most women and men, mostly women though in this case, uncomfortable talking about it? Less so now than in the past. I think there have been a lot of um, terrific advances with people like Angelina Jolie, for example, who really brought a lot of female reproductive cancers to light. How did she help? So she has um, a genetic defect called a BRCA mutation or BRCA1. BRCA, that, you, you jumped ahead of me, which I love, because you anticipated what I wanted to ask. She has the BRCA1, which means there's something going on in her family that she found out about that tells her what? Correct. The most important thing is for us to be proactive about our health. That's the most important thing for prevention. So we all have these genes, they're called BRCA genes. And so far, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are two genes that have been identified. And if those genes are working properly, they're like proofreaders. So they read a sentence, and if there's a typo, they'll correct that typo. Right. So she took a test. Correct. What do they tell her? So she has a defect in one of those proofreader genes, the BRCA1 gene, which puts her at very high risk for developing either breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So then she decides to do what? Well, there are screening mechanisms or prophylactic surgery. You know, in her case, her risk of breast cancer was almost 90%, 87% specifically. So rather than undergoing surveillance with mammograms and MRIs, she chose to have prophylactic a mastectomy. which A full bilateral mastectomy. Bilateral mastectomy, exactly. And these women have a very high risk of ovarian cancer, anywhere from 40 to 60% above the general population. So it's really important that women's tubes and ovaries are removed to help reduce their risk of ovarian cancer. Okay, but you know what's so interesting, doctor? She, she does this, it gets a lot of media attention. So millions of women are aware of it. Men too, but just in this case, let's just deal with women. Women watching it, listening to it, thinking about it, saying, I should do what? So what happens? Is there a, is there a significant spike and the number of women who do something about it? Do they get tested? And what do they get tested for? Excellent question. You know, unfortunately, most women who have this high risk for breast and ovarian cancer don't really know it. So it's very important for women and men to talk to their doctors about their family history, right. their personal history, to see if they're at high risk for cancer. Do they go, what is it, a blood test? What do they get? It's a blood test. It could also be from the saliva, the buccal. It helps uh, detect the DNA. It's as simple as that? It's as simple as that. You go in, they swab the right exactly and it tells you it's sent to a lab and then within about two weeks you find out whether or not you're at high risk for these cancers it's very incredible technology is, is there a difference between the blood test and the saliva test no equally as effective okay so let's go through the different types of cancers you said ovarian go through the other ones cervical so, ovarian cancer uterine cervical cancer vulvar and vaginal cancer so the great thing about what we do um, at Holy Name and as GYN oncologists or gynecologic oncologists is that we take care of the full spectrum of women. So not only are we surgeons like surgical oncologists, but we also give chemotherapy. So we really take care of the whole patient, hopefully through her cure. We get to know families and provide a really comprehensive, intimate environment for patients and their families. What drew you to this profession? Well, my grandmother was a gynecologist, which is, is kind of right? funny. She was a real pioneer. Well, she, I have to... Was she one of the only ones? She was one of the only ones. And she practiced in Washington Heights in Manhattan, which is too funny, so. So up in northern end of Manhattan. Exactly. She had to be one of the only. She was a real pioneer. Wow. So ever since I was a small child, I wanted to follow in her footsteps, and that's really what started my career from a very early age. But <laughs> it's interesting, not, was it just to become a physician or a particular type a physician? Definitely to be a physician, but also to take care of women. I had a, always a real interest in women's health. And then uh, during my training internship specifically, I really fell in love with the cancer patients, and that was my path from there. What I'm curious about is, in terms of the, the treating, you said you treat the entire 
woman because you're involved not just in surgery but chemo, you know, the radiation as well, right? Exactly. What about the family? You deal with the families. And I, I always ask myself, what is it like for a physician? I mean, I've had some difficult conversations when physicians had to tell me some things, but nothing nearly as serious as what you're talking about. How'd you ever get prepared to do that part, the, the Patch Adams part, the, you know, the, the humanism in medicine part that we were taught by Dr. Arnold Gold, you know who I'm talking about. Definitely. Um, pioneer in that field. What about it? You know, that's really the art of medicine, and I think that's something that we learn as we grow up, you know, t in our families and with our parents, how to be good communicators, and it's really important to be honest and to listen and to be an excellent communicator. So it's something that is innate, I think, in a lot of very good clinicians, uh, but also something that can be practiced and worked on over time. So I love to teach, and um, hopefully, you know, people follow by example the best ways to communicate. How much do you love what you do? Oh, I really love it. I'm very passionate about what I do. You're saving lives. Saving You're making lives. a difference every day in people's lives and helping them through very, very difficult times. And uh, I just continue to be amazed by the people we bring in. Dr. Sharon Lewin, who is the director of gynecologic oncology at Holy Name Medical Center. Um, I want to thank you for joining us and providing some important information. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. It was an honor to be here today. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Felician College, Health Republic, Insurance of New Jersey, Qualcare Inc., Johnson & Johnson, NJM, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Choose New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My name is Dr. John Brundbeck. I'm actually the uh, medical director of the Interventional Institute here at Holy Name Medical Center. But peripheral arterial disease actually is extremely common. It's one of the forms of hardening of the artery. As interventional radiologists, we perform minimally invasive image guided procedures. Generally, the procedures we do are alternatives to what would otherwise be major surgery. Almost 80% of those patients can avoid amputation if they're referred for us for these sort of procedures. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. 1-877-HOLY-NAME. Healing begins here.